So welcome everybody. Um, here we are, we are discussing the essence of Zen by Seke Harada. And tonight we are taking up page 130. We start on page 130 and we're just going up to almost to the finish of 133. Three short sections. <clears throat> I forget what today is. It's June 9th or something like June 10th. June 10th, 2020. So, um, you know, these sounds of the house that we hear, I was saying to Will tonight, we were talking about uh, Koben Roshi's teachings, which were that um, he felt that Zen practice would not truly become rooted in the United States until it was rooted at home, that home was, was our place of practice. So um, hearing these natural sounds that come from the backgrounds of your homes is just natural practice. It's our, it's our home practice. So we are certainly not disturbed by it. It sounds sort of uh, comforting in a way since we, uh, those of us who live alone, don't have the sounds of other people around us, so it's kind of nice to hear the sounds of others. So, so Harada Roshi starts off tonight by telling us, throw away your standard. And that sounds so dangerous. It sounds like an awful thing to throw away one's standards, because what could that possibly mean? What would it mean if we threw away our standards and we had no um, moral sense, or we had no sense of standards of ethics, or no laws or rules, and what would that mean? So, <clears throat> throwing away our standards is a, is a kind of a bold statement. And in one of our chants that we chant in the morning, we chant, don't make up standards on your own. If you don't understand the path as it meets your eyes, how can you know the way as you walk? Progress is not a matter of far or near, but if you are confused, mountains and rivers block the way. I humbly say to those who study the mystery, don't waste, do not waste your time by night or day. So this um, question of throwing away our standards, what does that mean? And what does that mean to us? It's something. But then he says, I think we can be comforted as we go down we can say we will be able to use them in a more meaningful way if we really understand what throwing away these standards means. What, what it means in ourselves to let go of those kinds of uh, essentially opinions about how our community should behave or how the world should be are standards that we hold that are simply opinion. I think he might be meaning that. And what do you, what do you think? What, what's your feeling about that? Do you know, do you feel threatened by everyone throwing away their standards? I, I feel that um, throwing away uh, the standards can mean that it makes us fear because standards can be something that, that gives you some stable in this world you know, to find your way in this world. And um, um, to throw that all away, you might be standing there um, with a lot of fear inside, you know, what, what can I hold on to when I have no standards anymore? So, and on the other side, I think it's, um, that it's so tricky that um, maybe we think we are throwing away our standards, but we don't do it deep down. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's still something left we, we, we hold on to, but what we think we have thrown everything away. So it's, it's just, uh, we think it, but we, we do not really do it. Right. We certainly feel that if somebody violates our space, for instance, if somebody, uh, you know, is, is, is uh, moves on us in some way that we feel you, you can't do that. That's not right. So 
those standards come up very, very quickly. Where are you? You're over there. Those standards just rise in us really quickly. And uh, at that moment, we realize that we still do have a batch of standards that we haven't really thrown them all away, as you say. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. uh, they, they continue to arise. So, yeah. um, so do, you, do you think when he is using another word for ego when he talks about standards? Edo-san, I was wondering the same thing. I really pondered this. You know, he said um, uh, something about you may be deeply cultured and have considerable knowledge. Forget all your standards just once. Just once. Then you will be able to use them in a more meaningful way. So when you ask the question, Sensei, about about whether this has to do with ego, I hope that's what it means because then that's the, that's the challenge, that's the meat of this. Because I live with all these, my education, and I'm well-traveled, but if he's asking us to give that up, then you come to a different place, right? Yeah, so I, I'm, as, as you were speaking, I'm wondering what it means to be a citizen of the world in which we accept all cultures. Yes. We are prepared to walk into any kind of world situation and simply work with it. I wonder what that, that means. You know, I, I spent a year in Japan teaching English conversation. I lived in Kyoto with a group of others who went over and um, during that year our purpose was to convert the Japanese without being um, you know without inviting them in any way it was our good example and as it turned out we I fell in love with the culture so much because how how the purpose of going over was different uh, when I came back and looked at the purpose for going over, you know? Yeah. So, yes, uh, being a, a person of the world is the question, yes. So I taught at a Catholic university in o Okayama, and the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. You and did? One, one of the nuns came from Ireland. I had been there a couple of years, and a nun came over from Ireland and she just said, I just can't believe it. These people are not Christian, but they're so kind. How could that be? Yeah. <laughs> so it's that sort of feeling that they're going over to convert, but they in turn actually are converted by the kindness of the culture or the, the way the culture works. They are converted into being able to work with it as mm -hmm. they find it every day. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing that happens when you go to Japan. And then, of course, there's a lot not so great about Japan, too. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, there, there's my standards coming up, right? <laughs> so, but, um, when I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. When I read those two sentences, Gilda, um, I focused on the last two words in the first sentence just once. He was asking us, my interpretation was, just consider, and you know, maybe in an ephemeral manner, to let go of your standards. And, and that can be a very freeing exercise in terms of just providing greater context for a much wider view. And when you go back to your standards, you're then able to, you see them in a completely different context and use them perhaps in a more compassionate way. And, and that's distinct perhaps than the idea of um, standards being the same as ego, which I believe is something we attempt to truly let go of, not just now and then, but as a way of life to let go of our ego self. I, I, can I add something here? Uh, I think my mic is unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes, okay. we can keep that listen. Yeah. All right. Um, I just know that uh, for the past week, at least, I've been really struggling with a lot of anger. And I think what's feeding that anger is a lot of my standards just completely being beaten down. And, um, and so when I read this, I was wondering if the, uh, the problem with the standards is that our ego or my ego self is using the standards to prop up or verify myself in some way. And um, that without the standards, when you, when you get rid of the standards, if you, you keep throwing it away, you keep throwing them away, um, you become much lighter. And I think, I mean, at least it feels like that for me. They come back all the time, of course. Um, but it's kind of like liberating them. Mm -hmm. and um and to be without standards without opinions and ideas just for a moment is is liberation i think mm -hmm. so we have the opportunity to allow yeah we the practice of allowance allow whatever it is come to come forward or allow ourselves to go forward mm -hmm. either way to act in the world without uh, uh, entanglement. Yeah. yeah. To be non judgmental, even for a while, could be incredibly liberating. Just once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just once. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I see in the last sentence of this section. Um, he seems to create a, a synonym of standards with viewpoint, which I think feeds into what we're discussing here. Um, <clears throat> for me, I'm thinking of um, something I was just talking about with so someone earlier today about um, standards in the terms of um, expectations. And I think, um, I think standards can also get in the way and in opposite way as well, where we set standards that are, are unachievable for ourselves, expectations, and and then when we fall short of them, that be, that too becomes uh, uh, an obstacle or a, um, a way of creating suffering <laughs> in my life. Um, so yeah, to, to be able to let that go and just to um, throw that away and, and not have a viewpoint and just let things be would be quite liberating. So maybe maybe he's also saying in that sense, Brian, that we we do set the high standards for ourselves, and when we don't meet them, we have to recognize we are human and we don't meet them. So we let go of the standards and then we start again. Yeah. And we re-see them and we you know continue in this um, round of 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 uh, setting some. Uh, standard for ourselves or some goal or something, whatever that word might be. And then um, to practice, it is a practice of self-compassion to recognize that when we don't meet that, that um, we need to practice compassion for ourselves in that moment in which we don't meet the, even the, we, we ourselves don't meet the standards that we set. Why should others meet my standards? when I can't meet my own. <laughs> I really feel like this uh, every day working at the clinic because in the moment when I'm taking in a new patient and if you don't know that patient, like, I mean, you really only have very little idea of who this person is, you know, so you take them in, um, uh, like, I do feel like it's, a dropping of standards. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly in the medical field, we are working like that. The people, we are so desperate for kindness and for understanding in that particular situation where somebody has some physical symptom that they're with, 
meet somebody with, with true kindness and allowance and acceptance is uh, true bodhisattva work. So, Thank you. Yeah, I'm finding that it's, you know, it's such, it's constantly this challenge, you know, and then to meet somebody with this kind of efficiency to, you know, you're taking a patient, like you have this moment with them, talking of you kind of exploring their problem, you know, and then you have to go, you know, but you have to engage with this person, you know, as who they are, as they present themselves to you in that moment. And that could be anything. Sure. And so two minutes of absolute quality listening uh, can really simplify that particular situation for somebody. So uh, that's all somebody is asking for when they come into that situation, into that clinical setting. So uh, that's hard work too, given the amount of people that you see, and their varying personalities and needs and what have you. Hugely challenging. So I salute you in your great work. <laughs> <laughs> difficult, very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, are we are we good on that paragraph? Anybody else want to anything else? I thought it was pretty straightforward and simple, but I also thought it was an important important uh, teaching to look at as part of his. Uh, looking at how the mind works and the thing that he's getting at. Well, I guess as I've listened to other other people, I was, I, I had this sense of like, because we've talked about preferences before. Uh -huh. right. And it's like standards seem like preferences. But I think as I think about it more, I, it's like standards are like, how you do something it's like the manual it's like this is what a ceremony is or this is how you sit right so i wonder if he's making that distinction to some degree yeah i i thought about that too will but i you know what hap what happens if we just say we don't have any standards for a ceremony for instance is he asking us then to move away from our um expectation of the ceremony to be a certain way such that we such that the power of the ceremony truly touches us i mean we could look at it that way but i guess well then it seems like an even finer point because i think to get rid of standards in the context of like a monastic setting which is i think ultimately where second heart or she's coming from it's it, it, it's different from getting rid of the form itself. Because I think you could get rid of the standard of like how good you should be within the form and exactly. still practice it. Correct. That's correct. Right. I mean, that's it. Is, is, uh, is he talking about my standard of my behaving a certain way so that I look correct in the ceremony? And that is what we want to let go of so that the ceremony essentially is larger than we are, and anything can happen in the middle of a, ce of a ceremony. I mean, huge mistakes can be made, and then you simply walk past them. And there's no such thing as a mistake except to go forward. The mistake is not to go forward. When you say it like that, it's like, I think to get rid of standard in that way, which seems, I think maybe how he would intend it, 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 it's like delocalizing you. It's like taking your own self out of the centrality of the force. Right, right. In which you're not comparing yourself to past performances or other people. Right, right. And that you know, works. I, I can also say that you know, in in the Zen world, there are different forms, and in the so there's the Rinzai form and there's the Soto form. And then even within Soto, there are all kinds of different forms depending upon what temple you are at. So sometimes uh, the Eheji style, Eheji will go to Sojuji, the other two uh, headquarters. And they will be very uh, critical then of how something is conducted in a different style. 
And so I think he is saying, don't get caught by that. It's the depth of the, of the ceremony itself, and not the style in which it is conducted. So don't, don't get caught by that. Like that, that comparative mind. Yes, yes. Right. So, so I, I think that, uh, you know, if we look at this, we take that in all kinds of different directions, the question of throwing away standards. I think it's another great thing to work on this week, those who like to pick something out of the teaching and to just work with something for a week. Looking at that, I think, is a really, really very fine thing to do. Um, and as Allison said, it's deeply liberating to let go of the notion of standards, of holding standards, of holding opinions, holding criticisms, holding judgments, et cetera, about how something is supposed to be. So that's a good, a good practice for the week for those who would like to take that up. So then we have this next thing called great diligence. Great diligence. So he's uh, asking us about this question of uh, looking at our zazen and also at the same time um, how we concentrate on one thing and how we speak single mindedly so that we forget what, even forgetting that we are doing uh, zazen. So, this question of uh, single mindedly. Uh, you know, to even forget that you are doing practicing zazen while you are so concentratedly sitting zazen is, you know, what he's been after through the whole book, of course, and asks us to try to sit in this way, which is, is a very tall order. It is not an easy thing to do at all, to be so single-minded that you completely forget where you are um, and Harada Roshi says in Zazen, there is no time, there is no place, and there is no distance from anything. So those are the three marks of, of Samadhi. And so if we uh, look at those, of course, we check ourselves and we think, oh, am I, am I aware of time? Well, then that's not Samadhi. Um, do I have a sense of distance from anything? Well, that's not, I'm not in samadhi then either. And if I think that I am here and where I am, that's not it either. So to come to those, uh, a, a, a practice in which we manifest ourselves or our self manifests in no time, no place, and no distance, um, that's full concentration. That is completely concentrated on one thing. Then that is where we come to. And to be able to come to that without looking at it and saying, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> really hard, friends. It's, it's really hard. And it happens rarely. It happens rarely for people in Zazen. So we can't think that our Zazen is poor if we don't achieve those, those moments. And yet that's not an achievement, it's a, maybe a moment of grace in which we are given that situation that we arrive at that Dharma moment. It, it, it's a moment of true grace. And I don't think we say grace in Buddhism, but we know what that means, we know what that is. It's a, it's a, it's a moment of pure gift to us to encourage us to continue. So, and then he says in the next paragraph, you know, you might be practicing shikantaza, or maybe you are practicing koan practice, or maybe you are counting your breaths, or maybe whatever that is. Whatever that is, be one with it. And there's not a, not a teacher I know who doesn't sometime count breaths to come back to that original practice, to settle oneself on the cushion, to maybe, maybe there's just so much to deal with for each one of us. And that's the only way that we are able to just be there and to be able to, to focus deeply. So we shouldn't think that 
if we practice with any of those techniques, quote unquote techniques, that there's something wrong with us or that we aren't practicing zazen, we are. And so, um, and then he goes on to the habit of thinking. Thinking is nothing but a habit. <laughs> Ow. Ow. <laughs> and, and it's sort of true. As we, as we sit strongly in Zazen, the, we, we just don't engage in thinking in the same way that we used to when we practice Zazen over a long period of time. We just don't. We, we see something that needs to be done and we move to it without the sense that um, we need to think ahead. Oh, I must do that. We just, we just aim that way. And so if our habit of thinking is strong, then the power of Zazen is weak. And so uh, to practice with a strong Zazen really assists us in uh, all of our activities because we aren't dwelling in the thinking mind that often drags us down, that uh, judges us, that judges others, that, you know, that, that is dissatisfied or whatever it is that the thinking mind does habitually. So, um, so he encourages us to then engage um, and we split in two. He says, the power of Zazen becomes weak. In that case, Zazen is split into two. The consciousness of the ego self and Zazen. So when, when Zazen is weak, the ego self is, is, is active on the cushion in thinking and looking at Zazen and worrying or whatever it is we do to engage in that way. Um, that is a split Zazen. So, very difficult. Here we come to the next paragraph in Sandokai, the harmony of difference and unity. And merging with principle is still not enlightenment. So here again, we come to uh, the standards of principle. I think he's working with the standards carrying through here. I mean, when we hold our principles so tight, this is a standard. And that itself is not enlightenment. Or if we uh, hold a standard of Zazen that says Zazen must be this way, and we still have, you know, we come off the cushion and we feel pretty good, that's still not enlightenment. So it, it's just not, it, it's, it's principle and it's not enlightenment. It's not liberation. So he says that a way to break that, a way to break through that principle is again, to go back to the practices of breathing, focusing on the breath and entering koan mu or whatever it is our practice is that we take up take up that practice because that is more beneficial to us than to sit in a split mind where we are in thinking about principle or thinking about certain things and we have a split zazen Yeah, any thoughts about that one, about that section? That's pretty straightforward too, pretty, pretty, pretty direct. So then he comes to, so what is the way then? What is the way? And he gives us this exchange between um, a Zen teacher and a student and a monk. 
and um, the way to mean the ultimate. We understand the way to mean the ultimate and the mind of peace and freedom or the truth. And the master replied, everyday mind is the way. Koban Rushi used to say that our practice should be the way we wash our face in the morning. That's it. Nothing more than that. You know, who, who do you wash your face for? Or who you think, you know, we don't think anything when we wash our face. We just, we just wash the face. And so, and we just brush the teeth. And so this is, this is the complete activity of practice, of just doing that without any intention. We, we just wash the face. We just wash our face every morning. We just brush our teeth. And it's that simple and that difficult. So, um, but we, we wash our face without thinking. I, I venture to say that most of us do that. We don't when and think, okay, now I'm going to wash my face. It doesn't happen that way. We turn on the water and we're washing the face and without thinking, without any activity of even what our face will look like after we wash it, it's water going on the face, the glory of water. So um, then he talks about creating waves when there is no wind. And that we, you know, I, I took that in a certain way until I read down through the paragraph. And uh, I suppose, you know, plenty of times we create waves when there is no wind. We create problems in our own lives. We create all kinds of dramas when there is no wind. And um, this is a condition of being conscious of or perceiving something. If you leave it this way, then there is no wind to make waves. <clears throat> so you just leave it at that. But on hearing an explanation of the way, you think, oh yeah, that's the way. Meaning, um, maybe I'm dissatisfied with how something has gone or I'm dissatisfied my, with my zazen or something. And somebody is, says, oh, did you try this? And you say, oh, I see, that's the way. And he says, we create waves by doing that. We create waves by something that is impossible, impossible to perceive. By perceiving something that is impossible to perceive. That is, we can't perceive zazen. And so we make waves around practice. We can't perceive the essence of practice. And so we create notions and ideas around it. And those he is talking about are waves. And that, that's very subtle, subtle stuff, actually. And as, as we know, uh, for all of us, for most of us, um, if we look at something, we begin to gauge in, in, in perception. And the same kind of thing we latch on to in practice because we want, the, we, we want that essence. We want, that, we want to feel that, um, that we arrived somehow or that we got, we got it. And to, to me, that is totally normal and uh, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but but it but it is normal to want to feel that one arrived. We all want to think that when at the moment of death we are okay because we did it, we got it. And I I think that's all Haridoshi is talking about. Do we practice in such a way that we ultimately get it, so that we don't have to worry about getting it anymore? It's, it's, it's really not any more than that. 
It's not that Harada Roshi's life has changed or that anybody's life will change particularly. It's just, did we get it? Did, did we get that? Do we know it? Do we know that we got that? Edo san, it's like um, the older I get, the more I think to myself, boy, I used to struggle so much to get something. And then it's like, I don't need that. I don't need to struggle. Um, and so I feel like I got it. I got that that life experience. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I do think that, that that settledness comes with age. Um, it I, is I, something like that, isn't it? It is about aging. I, I do think that's true and maturing that takes place if one hangs out with one's spiritual development for long enough, something ultimately clicks. And that is the promise of practice that Dogen Zenji, the Shakyamuni Buddha says, if you keep practicing, you will realize. You just will. You will realize. So. And ultimately, if you seek for it, I mean, this is the great conundrum. If you seek for it, you will go in the wrong direction. If you set up Zen or the way or the truth or the true self as being separate from yourself and then seek for them and try to understand them, in the end, you will only distance yourself farther from the way. So, you know, full acceptance of oneself as one is, recognizing that we are all flawed and need to develop, um, you, you know, or negotiating through that is part of development in which we are able to um, be humble enough to accept the fact that we are not perfect and we all need work. We need all need polishing. And at the same time, th that is how we are. And that is, that is our point of practice. And so, you know, in, from an Adleri, for you psychologists in the crowd, the Adlerian principle is that we are all flawed and because we are all flawed, we are able to engage together because we recognize the humanity in each one and, and don't require perfection because we are all flawed. And because we all have one tendency that is not helpful to us, uh, it allows us to be compassionate to everyone else because we're not perfect. So, um, so, but this is a fine, constantly negotiated line that we, that we walk together in terms of um, meeting ourselves at that moment of realization in which we see our ego in that moment and then must admit it and, and, and must accept that. And this is difficult negotiation all the time. We're negotiating it constantly. And, and you know, certainly, um, you know, Larry spoke a little bit ago, in which that, that practice of preconception, pre, pre, uh, or operating from a point of awakening would be our whole lives. And I think that, I think that you are a Buddha if you, got, if you can do that. Then you are a Buddha and you don't need to, you don't need to uh, have, you just don't need to be around people to polish you anymore, perhaps. Um, then, then you are a Buddha. There's a, there's a very, um, an interesting way that um, uh, that Dogen Zenji talks about this. Uh, I think the same concept, and you know, the 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 way is called different things. And in, in this particular fascicle, he's talking about the way is is what he calls inmo, I N M O, and inmo is translated as 
uh, IT, it, capital IT. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the way it goes is something, you know, paraphrasing here, but the way it goes is if you want to understand the matter, which is it, you have to be the matter, which is it. And now that you're the matter, which is it, what good is it in understanding the matter, which is it? So it kind of takes you in this circle. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and it reminds me very much of what we're talking here, this, between understanding and being. Yes, yes. So, I mean, this is, this is where be, we're being asked to just be, as we are, um, without self-consciousness, without uh, concern about the ego, which is, you know, just delusion. And so why worry about it? So much. <laughs> Nothing to worry about, essentially. So he says further in this, which is also um, on, this is on 133. This is a, toward the bottom of that first paragraph. He says, the condition Preceding the appearance of your own ideas is already the condition in which you accept things and hear things as they are. He's been saying that to see, to hear, to taste, to touch. Already that's the condition. In other words, it is a reality where you are one with things. This is what you must seek for. So this is what we must practice. And, and I, want, I want to say that, you know, without worrying about this question of seek, to be practicing is, is to be seeking. And so we don't have to run, if we are practicing, we don't have to run after the idea of seeking. Practice itself takes care of itself. Practice itself is our teacher. Practice Zazen is our true teacher. So we are already doing it. And once we get onto the cushion and once we begin to practice, we can never deny that we came to this practice. So you you are already soaking wet in the river and there you are. And that is, that is how it is. So, so the, the bodhicitta mind is already in uh, the the state of um, that precondition, so we don't have to worry about it. It already is at work in us. So this uh, other wonderful thing that he says down here is, before I understood everyday mind is the way, before I. I was used by time, but after I had truly understood everyday mind, I was able to use time. I don't know, I, I, I'm not there myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm afraid that, yes, I am used by time very often. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we have moments in which you are able to use time. <laughs> Those moments of uh, maybe we make a decision that we will, you know, engage in our artwork and we will give mm-hmm. ourselves the, the, we'll give ourselves that the leisure yeah. of being with our art and we will just engage with it. And that is to use time very definitely. But, but for most of us, um, we are used by time as we feel, oh, there's not enough time. And so that, that is our mistake, of course. Mm. The fact is that there's always time. Mm-hmm. So, but we don't always have enough energy for everything. We are human and it's not easy to feel that one can do everything. We can't, we can't. So it's a life made of choices always. And, um, this was one of the things we talked about way long ago, uh, as Will might recall. We talked about um, uh, 
the mind of leisure in zazen and the mind of practice and and how we use leisure and how we understand leisure mm. so um so that we talked about way back in september or something like that so i would say that that um sense that you're able to use time for me arises when i sense that i am exactly where i need to be doing exactly what i need to be doing in that moment mm -hmm. and the more often i can the more often i seem to experience that then the more honestly content i would be i am yes yeah and I might have told this story before, but I recall uh, uh, when Coben, uh, we, we got a new Zendo and we were given the floor of another building. We had to remove this wood floor and then we were going to call it over to the, the other building that we were going to do. We we're going to use all of this wood to put in a new wood floor in this other building. And so I showed up, I was so busy, I had a million things to do, and yet the Sangha was getting together to move, pick up this floor and move it. So I showed up, and I was truly resenting the fact that I was being asked to do all of this stuff, and I was exhausted and so forth and so on. And Coven came up to me and he said, if you've got something else to do, please go and do it. Just like that. And that's sort of it, that, it, it, you know, if I'm emptying the dishwasher and I really would rather be doing something else, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the dishwasher has to be empty. And so why not just empty the dishwasher and then go forward from there instead of being halfway with these things so as karen says to truly engage with whatever activity you are in right. or we are in or i am in is the best way right. so undoubtedly, <clears throat> oh, undoubtedly i spent too much time trying to figure out what he meant by being used by time and then using time i reached a point of just giving up on um on what time meant and arrived at a a place that perhaps he's saying you're a place of by knowing everyday mind you are in a place be between knowing and not knowing between delusion and indifference where there is no time um you know it's a it's a condition beyond perception like you were saying karen you get so focused on a particular task that time just disappears. Well, I think too, for me, it's, it's not just that time disappears because sometimes I'm also aware of what I'm doing within a sense of time, like a treat, you know, I'm almost treasuring what's going on because you know, it's only going to go on so long before you have to go on and do the the next right thing hopefully um but i th for me it's it's the, i'm able to use time means i'm engaged rightly so in whatever it is i'm doing and and i'm not just being used by this moment in some way um you know i'm not um unaware of time uh it, it it blends together um you know sort of this idea of uh, the right action at the right time in the right way with the right mindset um as opposed to if i'm being used by time i'm just sort of you know fluttering <laughs> right right and frequently i think when i'm conscious of time i'm not being fully present i'm either thinking about the past or i'm thinking about the future i'm just not focused on being present on the on the task at the moment and when i can uh, find that place then in that sense time disappears 
because it's right now. And once again, I think those are moments of grace. Those, those are gifts of the universe to us to give us those, those moments that allow us to continue. Yeah. My, my favorite line in, in this is still that line of sort of at the bottom of the second full paragraph on 132 by perceiving something that it is impossible to perceive you create waves yes and i think to me it because it, it's just i mean it's such a simple idea if you just don't add anything like enlightenment or some standard of like what a person should be like like it's like once you drop that, it it's like you can it, it's like then you're meeting what's happening. Like throughout this like haze of delusory, like of like because like any standard you have is essentially saying that what you're experiencing isn't right mm -hmm. or correct. In that sense, it's like standards are exactly what keeps you from experiencing like existence. And I would think like time is something like that. It's, it's like, I mean, in a real way, like we deal with the future. Like when we think about balancing our bank account or, you know, making sure we meet a deadline for work. But it's just that like not adding elements it's, it's just so trite and simple to say because if you tell yourself you're doing it that could itself just be an idea <laughs> of you thinking that you're doing it <clears throat> so it's it's like it, it i mean it, it's in some sense like he's giving us like the soto version of a koan it's like there's no point of understanding that is enough to understand this it, it's an experience itself I mean it, and you know you say it a hundred different ways and it doesn't really change that right I mean even if you get to the hundred and first way it, it's never enough <laughs> And Will, what's more, he's saying if you think you do understand it, uh, you're you're drifting further away. Yeah. Right, because that's just adding another thing. It's like I have my understanding of this reality. It's like you don't need to understand what you're in. It, it, you just need to be in it. <laughs> or you don't need to understand that you're in it. I don't know. It's so, a fine point to make. I uh, guess. Could you remind us of that experience that you had when you were at Great Val Monastery and Hogan? Oh, which one is this? When Hogan stood up. Somebody oh, 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 with the bell. Oh, yeah. I mean, that story. I have to say, it, it was a good one. Because we were in this workshop and someone just asked, like, just total, in all seriousness, like, what is authenticity? Um, what is what? I'm sorry. What is authenticity? Authenticity, okay. And I think someone tried to answer it, and, you know, they said whatever they said, but, like, Hogan Roshi, he ended up standing up, and he looked at him. I remember the kid's name, because I remember exactly what he said. He said Alex. And he was holding a mallet, and he just happened to be sitting right next to a bell, and he just rang the bell. And he said, that's authenticity. Don't add anything. Yeah. And essentially, that word authenticity is what we are talking about. Are, are, are we authentic in that moment with whatever, uh, whatever we are doing? And is, um, are we whole to it? So I, I think that uh, we're not using that word at the moment, but I think that that's a good word 
for what you were talking about, Will. So. No, thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, it's all, always so good. Hogan can be very good, <laughs> but sometimes he just is, because he's a, he, Hogan is a, a koan practitioner, and so he's got a lot of experience around that sort of, you demonstrate the, the koan, you, you do it, you know. So, uh, yeah, Allison knows Hogan also, right? She also practiced for, yeah. Uh, he stopped me in my tracks a few times, <laughs> you know, just kind of cut me off, cut through everything, and it, it, it was good. Yes, yes. Allison did uh, a practice period, uh, three months. Uh, was it three months you were at? It was actually about two months, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, all right. All right, well, what else uh, do, do we have here? These were fairly, this was a fairly simple, simple, but so difficult um sections short sections so is there anything looking back on them that you would like to mention or uh, that you see that you would like to bring up i'm, I'm just staring at this line it's so beautiful it's on it's the first full paragraph on 133 about halfway down the condition preceding the appearance of your own ideas is already the condition in which you accept things and hear things as they are. I mean, it's just out of the park. You want to, you want to unpack it for us? Well, I mean, I think that's the elegance of it. I mean, it, well, cause it, it's like, I think it's like framing it in a very clever way because it's like, because I think, like, I oftentimes have a sense like there's something I'm missing. Mm. And it's like, then it creates, it creates this, like, in the causal egoic mind, it's like if things aren't the way that they should be, there's something I need to do. Like, I have to, like, correct this sense that things aren't what they should be. But he, he like almost like reverses the causal chain, just reminding you it's, it's like that sense of things not being exactly right is because you're just already ahead of what's happening. It's like that backward step notion, I think. Well, do you know the question that's sometimes asked who were you before you were born? It, isn't that similar to what you just read? Um, I mean, it's a whole, whole totally different scale, maybe. But um, uh, before you know, you're you're an idea. Before you are a concept of you, uh, in 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 the same way, what you just read before something formulates into a concept, uh, that's that's the authentic state. Yeah, and it's like. I think like the precedent in the West, it, it's like you're, um, that's like why philosophers created the word existentialism. Because it, 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 it's like the phenomenological viewpoint that like being precedes essence. It's not like there's a you and then from the you, you have experience. Like experience precedes that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, 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 I mean, there's like so many different ways of talking about it, which is sort of the problem, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we deal in it. it. It's like our minds want to deal in this linguistically, you know, and like abstract, like our experience in a causal way. Which, which makes experience seem causal. It makes it seem constructed. All right, well, let's, let's finish out. And then if there's any uh, little bit of uh, discussion that people want to do, um, 
let's let's finish with our chant, but then come back if anybody wants to talk a little bit about about um, the world we are in. <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right. So we will just uh, do N M G K U K A N O N G Y O L. So. N M G K U K A N O N G Y O L. O K A N Z E. Sutra extend to each thing in all places, so that we and all sentient beings may together be the Buddha way. Buddha's ten directions three times. All beings, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom. Maha Prajna Paramita. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 